Um, for those of you who haven't had the privilege of hearing him talk, Svante is an evolutionary geneticist. He's known as one of the founders of paleogenetics, a discipline that uses the methods of genetics to study early humans and other ancient populations. Since 1997, he's been the director of the Department of Genetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. He grew up in Stockholm, earning his PhD from Uppsala University in 1986, where his work focused on how E19 protein of adenoviruses modulates the immune system. So if we speed ahead 10 years, um, he is of course most well known for his studies of early humans and other ancient populations. In 1997, his team reported their successful sequencing of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, which of course was, was just amazing. Um, in February 2009, in collaboration with others, his team completed the first draft version of the Neanderthal genome. He's also responsible for the DNA analysis of what we now know to be the uh, Denisova um, hominin. He has a long, long list of awards and accomplishments that are you know, way too long for me to go, to, go through. But to just name a, a few highlights, he was elected a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in 2000. In 2013, he received the Gruber Prize in Genetics. In 2016, he won the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, which is um, an enormous achievement. And in 2018, the European Science Prize. And finally, in 2020, the very prestigious Japan Prize. And there are many um, that I didn't go through. It is our enormous pleasure to have him here um, and to hear about the most recent advances from his lab. So, Svante, take it away. Well, thank you, Ling, for that very generous introduction. It's a bit sad to give this talk and realize that there will be no lobster dinner afterwards to enjoy. But uh, we're of course very grateful to the staff that this meeting does take place so efficiently. So what I wanted them to start by doing is simply remind you uh, about what you all already know, I think, that modern humans evolve in Africa and sometime less than 100,000 years ago, maybe around 70,000 years ago or so, they start spreading seriously out of Africa and the Middle East and meet and replace other forms of humans that lived in Eurasia. Most famously then Neanderthals in Western Eurasia and other forms of now extinct hominins in Eastern Eurasia. And uh, our lab is then obsessed, if you like, with Neanderthals. And to the left here is a Neanderthal skeleton. Uh, uh, so these robust hominins. And they appear in the fossil record of Europe and Western Asia around 400,000 years ago and disappear around 40,000 years ago when modern humans on the right here appear. And we are so obsessed with Neanderthals basically because they are the closest evolutionary relative of all present day humans. So if we want to define ourselves from a genetic or physiological perspective as a group, it's really them that we should compare ourselves to. It's also interesting that they were here rather recently, just 40,000 years ago or so, so it's interesting how they related to modern humans when, when they appear. So uh, if you then want to study the genomes of Neanderthals, you have to deal with some technical issues. It's very little DNA there. The vast majority of the DNA in fossils that are tens of thousands of years old is microbial. And so even tiny amounts of contamination from present day humans can distort your results. And an important factor is that those fragments you retrieve from the fossils are very short. This is even from a very good specimen. Much more typical is that you have nothing about 60 or 70 bases in length. So when we then map these fragments to the human genome. An issue is that we can only map to parts of the genome where we can confidently 
put down and map such short fragments. So in reality, it's around two thirds of the genome that we have accurately sequenced when we say we sequenced an Neanderthal genome. And already back in 2010, then, when we had the first very rough draft of the Neanderthal genome, it became clear that no matter what present day humans we looked at outside Sub Saharan Africa, they carry something like 1 or 2% of the genome from Neanderthals. Suggesting then that when modern humans started leaving Africa, they early on started mixing with Neanderthals. We now begin to learn much, much more, of course, primarily because we now have some high quality Neanderthal genomes. So from this site in southern Siberia in the Altai Mountains, the Niseva Cave, there is one Neanderthal genome of 50x coverage. There's one from Croatia in southern Europe of 30-fold coverage. There is a genome coming along that is almost 30x coverage from the next valley over, if you like, in the Altai Mountains. That genome you can download, and there's a paper coming out very soon on it. And one interesting thing then when we look at these three genomes is that this more recent genome that's around 80,000 years old or so in southern Siberia is more closely related to the southern European Neanderthal here than to the older Neanderthal that lived some 40,000 years earlier in the next, next valley over. So if you look on more Neanderthal genomes, a more modest quality that we have from Europe, going back in time up to 120,000 years, it turns out that they are actually all more closely related to these Western type Neanderthals than to this old one from the Altai Mountains. So this then suggests that sometime between 120,000 years ago and 80,000 years ago, there was a movement of Neanderthals from west to east, replacing Neanderthal populations in the east. So we are beginning to learn about Neanderthal population history and see that there were actually major events in their history. And we will for sure be learning more about that then in the, in the next few years. Um, what we also begin to learn about from studying these high quality genomes is a bit about the demography of Neanderthals. A striking feature in their genomes is that if we look at the Neanderthal genomes here, that they have these large segments of uh, homozygosity where both chromosomes are identical, suggesting that the parents were rather closely related suggesting that they lived in small populations. So you see much more of these homozygous stretches than you see in any present day human populations. So if you look at these three genomes, we can then model this and show that the two Eastern Neanderthals, given some reasonable migration rate between subpopulations were really very small populations in the order of 50 individuals or so. Whereas the one Western Neanderthal where we have a good genome is bigger, although not as big as most modern human populations were. So as now more high quality genomes will be coming along in the next year or two, there will be two genomes from the Russian Caucasus, uh, one 40,000, one about 70,000 years old. There will be a genome from Poland, one from Belgium, and another Neanderthal genome from the Niseva cave. It will be possible to see if this is a pattern that will hold up. Maybe that the Neanderthal populations in the west were bigger, and these ones on the eastern margin of the range may have been uh, smaller in size. There are, of course, also a number of more modest quality Neanderthal genomes. There are five published to date. There are many more coming along. Among them, 61 Neanderthals, where we have captured 1.2 million SNPs from their genomes that vary among Neanderthals and uh, among humans to reconstruct their population history. And that will then be coming along in the next year or so. The other interesting aspect 
is uh, of course comes from then the Nisseva cave in the Altai mountains where there was this very small bone uh, where we were able some years ago to reconstruct a high quality genome and we're very surprised to find that this was not a Neanderthal or there were Neanderthals in this cave, it was something else that went back to a common ancestor shared with Neanderthals in the order of 400,000 years ago or so. So we then called this group of hominins the Nisavans after this site. We have the unfortunate situation that we have Neanderthals from the Nisava cave and we have the Nisavans from the Nisava cave that we sort of have to keep uh, straight when we talk about them. And these Denisovans then have have um, contributed to present-day people in Asia. So all over mainland Asia, there is a small amount of contribution from the Nisavans, about tenfold less than the Neanderthal contribution to non-Africans. And out in Oceania, there's a much bigger uh, contribution, something like five or six percent, so even like uh, 10 times more than the uh, Neanderthal contribution or so. So uh, Browning et al, together with Josh Aiken and his group, has then studied this contribution from the Nisibans and done beautiful work where they compared, for example, in Papua New Guinea here, the segments in the present-day Papuan genomes, how they relate to the Neanderthal genome and find this contribution that's as close to that genome. And they find the Denisovan contribution that's, however, quite distant from the Denisovan genome we have sequenced. And it's the same situation if you look in, in Pakistan or India. However, if you look in East Asia, in China or in Japan, you find this Neanderthal contribution, you find this contribution that's quite distant from the Denisovan genome, and in addition, a contribution from some population that's are quite close to the Denisovan genome that has been sequenced. So this suggests that there is at least two Denisovan populations that have contributed to Asians. And there is some indication that there might even have been more. So I think a picture that's emerging is that Denisovans were probably even much more numerous than Neanderthals and had a more interesting population history that will be revealed in the future with different distinct populations, whereas Neanderthals look quite homogeneous actually. So far, the Nisivan remains have only been retrieved from this site, the Nisiva cave in southern Siberia. But so, so it was very exciting last year when a mandible was described from a site in Tibet, high up about 3,000 meters on the Tibetan plateau. It's a mandible that is quite old, over 160,000 years old. There was no DNA retrieved from it, but with mass spectrometry, uh, a group was able to study some bone proteins and there was one amino acid there that matches the, the Nisivan genome rather than Neanderthal and modern human genomes. So it may very well be that this is indeed the Denisovan, suggesting then that the Nisivans may have lived in Tibet over a quite a long time at high altitudes, maybe even ad adapting to life at high altitudes. Hopefully one will learn more about this from more genomes. At least from the Nisova cave, there are more genomes coming. There are upgrades of some of the previous specimens we have studied where we now with better techniques can get more of the genomes out. So it would be a 5X genome, a 3X genome of a specimen that is a lot older than these other specimens. And there's also a new specimen that will uh, come along. I wanted to spend two, three minutes pointing out a sort of uh, interesting quirk with the genomes of Neanderthals and the Nisibans. And that is that when we look at the nuclear genome, we have now seen them, as we discussed, that the Nisibans are the sister group of Neanderthals and modern humans fall outside them. However, if you look at the mitochondrial genome, the picture is different. There, the Denisovan mitochondrial genome falls outside 
the variation of Neanderthal mitochondria and modern human mitochondria. So modern humans and Neanderthals look like cis babies. So there is a discrepancy here between the mitochondrial genome and the nuclear genome. There is another observation of relevance for this, and that comes from the very oldest hominin specimens from which uh, DNA has been retrieved. It's a site in Spain, a bit over 400,000 years old, where it's a deep site where Matthias Meyer in our department has been able to retrieve a little bit of nuclear DNA from some of the individuals that have been found there. And these Individuals are clearly early Neanderthals, they're on the Neanderthal lineage. However, when he sequenced the mitochondrial genome from this individual, or from one individual there, it fell together with the mitochondrial genome of the Nesevans and Foley's of falling outside as an outgroup to Neanderthals and modern humans, although this is an, an early Neanderthal or an ancestor of Neanderthals. So this led us and others to suggest that maybe there had been some gene flow into Neanderthals from Africa, ancestors of modern humans that introduced this mitochondrial DNA to Neanderthals. So it would of course be very interesting to look not only on the maternal inherited part of the genome, but the paternal inherited Y chromosome also. And over the last few years, it has actually been sort of a frustration to us that all the Neanderthal genomes from which we have retrieved reasonable amounts of DNA have turned out to be female. We have not had a chance to look at the Y chromosome. But now Matea Heidenjak have looked systematically on many, many specimens and identified three Neanderthals, male Neanderthals, for which you can retrieve DNA, and two Denisovans of the Denisovans from the Nisva cave. So Mark and Petra then designed, uh, together with Janet Kelso and her group, have designed uh, capture probes for about seven megabases of single copy DNA on the Y, y chromosome. So we can now have a first view of the Y chromosome of both Neanderthals and the Nisivans. And they have sort of reasonable coverage for, for these. So, if we then reconstruct the phylogeny of the Y chromosome, the Denisovan Y chromosome again falls as an outgroup to the Y chromosomes of Neanderthals and modern humans. So it looks like the mitochondria. So this then supports a view where Neanderthals are the sister group of Denisovans, but that there have been some gene flow from ancestors of modern humans in Africa into Neanderthals that then introduce the Y chromosome into Neanderthals and introduce the mitochondria into Neanderthals. So that late Neanderthals have this sort of Y and mitochondria more related to modern humans. One can say, wonder why that would happen, why would that replacement take place? And I think there are sort of indications from several studies that the effective population size of Neanderthals was so much smaller than of modern humans that slightly deleterious variants tended to become fixed among Neanderthals. And that may particularly affected sort of non-recombining parts of the genome, such as the mitochondria and the Y chromosome, so you can show by modeling with reasonable population sizes that a selective advantage of the modern human Y or mitochondria of say 2% would actually result in a 50% chance that they became fixed in Neanderthals. So this then supports sort of uh, other lines of evidence that there was gene flow into Neanderthals that didn't affect the Nisivans from modern human ancestors that was presented also two days ago at this meeting by David Harris, for example, from the Tishkov lab. What is also happening, I should say, is that several of these other gene flow events that we um, infer from the genomes, we begin to see direct evidence of it from uh, DNA from fossils. The first case of that came a few years ago already which was in Romania, this 
uh, mandible of a modern human that's around 40,000 years old. So when we looked at the genome of this individual, we found seven large chromosomal segments that is purely of Neanderthal origins. So this then suggests that this individual had a close relative who was Neanderthal, and you can show that six, five, or four generations back, this modern human 40,000 years ago in Romania had a Neanderthal ancestor. So we sort of stumble across someone who is quite closely related to this gene code that from Neanderthals into modern humans. The other strike in such case comes from the Nisava cave, where together with Tom Hyams group in Oxford, we have screened thousands of bone fragments that you find. The vast majority of them come from animals, but now and again, you find a hominin bone fragment. And one of the fragments I found here, when we studied the genome and plot on the chromosomes here in blue alleles that are Neanderthal-like and in red ones that are Denisovan one like you find that all chromosomes or almost homogeneously, both blue and red, suggesting then <coughs> that this is a first generation offspring of a Neanderthal mother, because the mitochondria is Neanderthal, and a father who was Denisova. And not only that, if there are some regions here, regions of a megabase or more, one is highlighted here where this individual looks solidly Neanderthal. So both chromosomes look Neanderthal like. Suggesting then that the father here had some Neanderthals back in his family tree. So among these gene flow bands, we stumble across another one here, the direct offspring of a mixture between Neanderthals and Denisovans. So this sort of begins to be seem like we're almost too lucky. We run into this quite often. It suggests, first of all, of course, that these groups are mixed quite often in the cases when they have met. But it's also really striking that among just six individuals from the Nisova cave who have DNA information, one of them turns out to be this direct first generation offspring of a Neanderthal and the Nisova. If we think about modern humans for which we have DNA information and that lived so long ago that they had a chance to meet Neanderthals in their lifetime. We have DNA information from just three such individuals, one from Western Siberia, one from outside Beijing, and this individual from Romania. So one out of three of these have a close Neanderthal relative. So I think it will be very exciting in the next year or so to try to find more of these very early modern humans and see how they relate to Neanderthals. Because it might be that one aspect at least of how Neanderthals or Denisovans disappeared may have been that they were simply assimilated into maybe larger modern human populations. So for the last 10 uh, minutes or so, I then wanted to focus on other aspects that I begin to get more and more interested in lately. And that is then what functional inferences we can hope to draw in the future by now having these archaic genomes from our closest relatives. And also for three aspects of that, I wanted to bring one example for each of this. One then involves things that became fixed in modern humans in the last half million years or so after we separated from Neanderthals. Another aspect of then contributions from Neanderthal variants into the present day human population that may have consequences sometimes. And the other one are things that became fixed among Neanderthals since we separated from a common ancestor with modern humans. So if we first focus on these things that became fixed among modern humans, uh, that then changed here and became present in all or almost all present day humans. We can catalog those things now. And we're of course interested in them because they might be involved in functions that could be typical of modern humans. 
So that then involves things like technology that start changing rapidly with modern humans and become regionalized in different parts of the world. Figurative art, art that really depicts something that you immediately can recognize what it is. And of course, modern humans replaced all the other forms of hominins, became much more numerous and spread to all habitable parts of the planet. So if we list those things quite strictly and say we just look at things that are fixed or almost fixed, there are not very many changes. It's in the order of 30,000 single nucleotide changes, a few thousand things that are probably regulatory and only in the order of 100 amino acid changes. Just give you a feeling for how we can begin to go after this. If you look at the amino acid changes, we, have, we can list, of course, all the protein coding genes that carry such fixed changes, recent fixed changes in humans. If you just look at one of these, it's an enzyme, ADSL, that catalyzes two steps in purine biosynthesis. So the synthesis of guanine and adenine. We get, got particularly interested in this enzyme because of work by Philip Kaikovich's group in Moscow, a previous postdoc in our lab. And they study the metabolome of the human brain and compare it to the brains of chimpanzees and macaques, looking for things that significantly differ in humans relative to the two other primates. So things that are human specific in the metabolome. And one of the few pathways they find that are consistently changed, the metabolite, the concentration on the metabolites, is purine biosynthesis, where many uh, sort of metabolites downstream of ADSL occur at lower concentrations in the human brain than the brains of these other primates. So they know that this is a change that happens somewhere on the long lineage from the common ancestor with the chimp. And this ADSL change to the Neanderthal was very tempting to look at because that amino acid change sits close to the, not in, but the close to the active site in the enzyme. So one of the things we've done with this is to then introduce and centralize this position by CRISPR-Cas9 in human cells back to the ancestral state and look at the metabolome of such cells. And what we then find is that indeed the metabolites downstream of ADSL are, uh, occur at lower levels. So this change that they observed to the apes is actually a very recent change in human evolution that happened in the last half million years or so. And an interesting challenge is, of course, to think about what consequences that may have uh, for the whole organism. But so one direction we are then going is to introduce these changes that are challenging to study because we don't have variation among present-day humans, right? So uh, we introduce them, or Chris, want to introduce them with CRISPR-Cas9. So we're working on more efficient ways to precisely edit change single nucleotides in the genome. That's particularly Stefan Riesenberg in our group who develops more efficient methods to do that. So that relies on down-regulating repair pathways of this double-stranded breaks that you introduce in the first step when you want to edit an upregulating homology dependent repair that's the pathway by which you introduce a precise change. So he has now come so far that he can precisely edit three or sometimes even four genes. So for three genes here, for example, he can edit them to homozygous ancestral state. So all six chromosomes is around 30% of the cells in a bulk edit. You can then sort the cells. About a third of your cells have these three changes. If you do four, you have in the order of just 5% or so. So the idea is that we would not just study single such changes. We would sort of enlarge this starting with, say, other enzymes that may influence the metabolome, to maybe ancestralize the metabolome in the cell, and eventually ancestralize all the proteins to ancestralize the proteome and go on from there. So that's sort of one direction where this is going. 
Now, um, the other aspect is then contributions from Neanderthals into modern humans. That's a bit easier to study because it's variable among present day humans. I just want to bring one example that we recently have been interested in, and that involves a progesterone receptor. So this receptor uh, has an amino acid change, uh, and it turns out that that change happened on the Neanderthal lineage and was introduced to modern humans by gene flows. It occurs outside Africa, particularly in Europe here, and it's a well-known risk variant for preterm births, the premature births. So when it was realized that this occurred in all the Neanderthal genomes that are available, were also people who speculated that this should have posed a significant selective disadvantage to Neanderthals with an increased risk of preterm birth. However, what you can now begin to do is that you can follow alleles in the modern human population across time. Because in the meantime, we have something like over 5,000 modern human genomes of different ages where we have whole genome information or, or SNP information from across the whole genome. Particularly David Rice group at Harvard has contributed to that. And this is a little animation that we have made based on their database that they uh, make available, where we can then follow this progesterone receptor variant from 15,000 years ago up to present day, plotting here in black the variants of this Neanderthal risk allele starting 15,000 years ago and then going forward in time. And we will see that this risk release pop up. And somewhere 7,000 years ago, it more or less explodes and becomes very frequent in populations in Western Eurasia, which seems very surprising if this should be a selective disadvantage, as you would imagine, risk for preterm birth would be. So what uh, Hugo Seberg, who works with us uh, from the Karolinska in Stockholm, did was to look in the UK Biobank on associations with the modern, non-Neanderthal-like allele. And he then finds, surprising to me, that this modern allele is actually associated in the UK Biobank with increased risk of bleeding early in pregnancy, with miscarriages, and it's negatively associated with numbers of full sisters and as actually also full brothers, but it's less significant. So it turns out that this sort of protective allele, modern human allele, is actually associated with miscarriages and having less siblings. So our current thinking about this variant then is that indeed the Neanderthal variant is associated with preterm births, but it's also associated with protection against miscarriages and with having more live siblings. So rather than being a disadvantage, it probably has an advantage. And what may go on is that this variant somehow uh, saves pregnancies that would otherwise miscarriage. And the price you pay for that, so to say, is an increased risk for preterm births. This illustrates, I think, the value of these big cohort studies where you can associate variants in the Neanderthal variants, for example, in the human background with actual phenotypes. So finally then, what we begin to be able to also study now is things that have become fixed among Neanderthals, or at least of high frequency. Because we now then have Three Neanderthal genomes that cover the geographical range of Neanderthals quite well, and that also differ a lot in time. From this one here that's 120,000 years old to this one that's perhaps 50,000 years old. So if things are homozygously present in all these genomes, in all these three genomes, they are at least probably of high frequency among Neanderthals. So Hugo Seberg again has sort of looked through uh, protein coding genes, and one stood out in that it had three amino acid changes fixed among these three Neanderthals that was not sort of present in, in modern humans. 
And this is an ion channel, and it's not just any ion channel, it's now 1.7, which is the, the channel protein that sits in peripheral nerve endings and initiates a sensation of pain. So uh, what he then did was to express the Neanderthal version of this channel and the modern human version in frog oocytes and also in, in human cells and study the, their electrophysiology. And what he then finds is that for a certain stimulation, the, the Neanderthal version here in red sort of uh, lets through a bigger current than the modern human version. And it can show that that's not due to that the channel opens faster, but it closes more, with more delay. So the inactivation is delayed. It lets through, it remains open for a longer time for a given stimulation. So to say. He can then also show that this difference here is not due to any signal amino acid difference, but an epistatic effect of two of these, the two intracellular amino acid changes, whereas the extracellular one doesn't seem to have a function for, for this. Anyway. So this would seem that the Neanderthal receptor or, or the channel was sort of more sensitive to that. So if you then look in the UK Biobank, we thought this was not occurring in modern humans, but it actually turns out that if you look among 360,000 individuals, you find this Neanderthal variant at a very low frequency, but you find over 1,000 individuals that carry this variant. So you can then look at questionnaires where these people answered questions about pain in their lives. There are 16 questions there that deal with pain in different, all types of different pains, chest pain, uh, stomach ache, headaches, and so on, and ask what the sensation of pain associates with. And of course, being getting a bit older, the sad thing is that what pain particularly associates with in your life is your age. The older you get, the more pain you report. It's trivial, there are more medical problems. You can begin to ask politically incorrect questions, asking if men or women report more pain in their lives. Luckily, there's no difference whatsoever. But more interestingly then, you can ask about people who carry this Neanderthal variant. And they do report more pain in their lives than people that don't carry this variant, significantly so. So in terms of this age effect then, it is as if you were eight years older in terms of the pain you report if you carry this Neanderthal variant. So of course this doesn't mean that the Neanderthals really perceive more pain because there's much more to feeling pain than what this ion channel does. Your sensation is modified in the spinal cord and even much more so in, in the brain, of course. Nevertheless, it's very striking that people who are then heterozygous from this Neanderthal variant do report more pain. Neanderthals were, of course, homozygous for this variant. So it's sort of very tempting to think that maybe we should modify our view of Neanderthals a little bit as these brutish, insensitive people. Maybe they were actually quite wimpish. So coming to a more summary, I hope I sort of illustrated to you that having the genomes of our closest evolutionary relatives is very useful because we can now begin to ask what is unique to modern humans, what evolved in the last half million years and became fixed among modern humans, what became fixed among Neanderthals as we get more Neanderthal genomes, and we can begin to study the effects of these things, sometimes by studying them when they appear in modern humans thanks to gene flow. For this, it would be very useful to use big cohort studies such as the UK Biobank, but it will also, I think, be quite important to do experiments where you ancestralize human cells, particularly the stem cells, perhaps, that you can uh, differentiate them to different tissues. And sometimes also in mice, that you will neanderthalize mice and humanize mice. 
and sort of I'm very excited about studying these, these sort of functional consequences. And until just two months ago, I thought I had very little time because I would have to retire in two years. But now fortunately and very generously, I have just learned that I will be able to go on for another eight years uh, to have a group at our institute in Leipzig. And in parallel with that, uh, we are now starting a group that will also work on these functional uh, questions at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. So these will be sister groups and ideas that when one can travel again, people will go between those groups that will focus on different aspects of this. So you can look up this new group if you like, and we are actually looking for senior postdocs and, and scientists to sort of start this up. So there are far too many people who have helped uh, in all these projects and I can mention, I will then mention just the three people that will go on and generate and analyze archaic genomes in our department in uh, Leipzig, while I go on with most of the functional things, is Matthias Meyer, who developed much of the methodological lab methods that make this possible. Janet Kelsey, who does all the informatics and much of the uh, population genetic things, and Benjamin Peter, who does uh, population genetics. And with that, I then thank you for your attention. Thank you. Oh, Elaine, you just muted yourself. I muted myself. Oh, Elaine just muted herself, but thank you, Sante, for a okay. <laughs> fantastic talk and um, virtual nice. applause. There we go. <laughs> So Jay, again, is going to um, handle the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got um, a lot of questions rolling in, and, and please um, please keep them, keep them coming. So why don't we just start off with uh, uh, this one here. It was asked pretty early on. Um, how, did, how did the Neanderthals and Denisovans get there? Did they also have an out-of-Africa migration event? Yes, I presumably have. There's something that paleontologists called Homo heidelbergensis, where you find uh, fossils with this morphology, both in Africa and outside Africa, which are presumably the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans that come out of Africa and then evolve in the east to Denisovans and in the west to Neanderthals, somewhere half a million years ago or a bit more. That question was, um, okay, another question. Um, what was the timing of that? Um, more than half a million years ago. More than half a million years, okay. Yeah. Um, question from Taras uh, Vilgaius, the postdoc. Um, as we get a better understanding of Neanderthal genetic diversity, do we know what proportion of variation, genetic Neanderthal genetic variation is segregating in modern humans? Um, mm -hmm. The only way with which we have looked at that and others, there's also a paper from Iceland that just came out, is that about half the Neanderthal genome exists in modern humans. Different individuals carrying different parts of it. For some regions that have come over, so we see several alleles actually. So the TLR region, uh, for example, that uh, I've been studying in this department, have come over at least three times. From, uh, so there are three uh, versions of that. There are two alleles, two haplotypes of this progesterone receptor that come over from Neanderthals. But I don't really have an answer to how much of the allelic variation, so to say, overall have come over. Eventually we'll have that, I guess. Great. Okay. So here's a here's a um, question from Mariela Cortez Lopez, a PhD student. Um, have the new genome assemblies with long read sequencing technologies changed any of the hypotheses of gene flows within population when when compared to the Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes? Mm. Oh yes, we begin to get better present day genomes with long read techniques. To be quite honest, we still map to HD19 actually here. Um, so they have not really had an impact yet, I would say. Okay. Um, question from Yav Yaved Mohammed is a postdoc. 
Are there any confident examples of Neanderthal fixed differences, i.e. homozygous in all three Neanderthal genomes, that occur in the non-coding cis-regulatory regions? And are these adjacent to genes important for adaptive morphological traits? Mm -hmm. The examples of differences in FOXP2 and ADCL are and all existing examples mm -hmm. on their own, but we haven't heard much about the non-coding genome. Yes. So, um, yes, there are such things. We haven't studied this very much. We are very interested in some changes in NOTCH2, where the Neanderthals do seem to have a sort of fixed difference that we're actually trying to study in, in mice at the moment. Uh, but we have no, yes, sort of no data on that yet. But that is very interesting. Another sort of direction where we want to go is to when we have multiple, we can edit sort of tens or hundreds of positions in multiple rounds is to sort of try to ancestralize the transcriptome by changing both amino acid transcription factors and transcription factor binding sites in the cells. But that's sort of uh, quite far in the future, I think. Interesting question from uh, Janelle Wallace, who's a PhD student. Do we have any idea why Neanderthals had much smaller population sizes slash group sizes? Just chance or functional slash cultural differences? I would think it's cultural and sort of, a, I think probably the Neanderthals and Denisimus were much more typical of different hominins, I would guess. Uh, my gut feeling is that modern humans are quite unique in expanding their population size drastically. And that that is sort of behind this replacement uh, that we see. Um, another question from uh, Arvinda Chakravarti, um, you know. Uh, great work as usual, Svante. Um, although you report intriguing associations um, uh, from human Neanderthal protein coding differences, what have these sequence changes taught us about the major anthropo anthropometric phenotypic differences uh, between these species with respect to height, weight, et cetera? Uh, so there's not so much known about that. There is a mapping study where we were peripherally involved uh, that was done in Holland, where they looked at MRT or present day people and associated with introgressed DNA fragment from Neanderthals and could show three regions in the genome where there is an association with, with having an oblong uh, sort of cranial form that's typical of Neanderthals versus modern humans. Modern humans. MRP, you mean MRI? Or? MRI, so MRI. yes, sorry. <laughs> Uh, modern humans have a much more uh, rounded cranium. So there is this association study. There is something that actually associates with something you can see in the skeleton, which is sort of exciting. The precise genetic changes in those regions is, of course, not known. There is, again, this notch two changes that we are interested in and pursuing that may have something to do with morphology, but yes. Uh, great. So a question from uh, Ziao Zuo, a postdoc from the Wang Lab at Wash U. Is it, is it, it's probably a short answer to this one, but is it, is it biochemically possible to sequence archaic RNA? Um, I would guess no would probably be the simple answer. Yes, yeah. I think it's too unstable. Um, okay. Uh, Juan Rodriguez Flores, uh, PNI, PI in industry. Uh, you show that Denisova range from Tibet to Papua New Guinea. Is there data and evidence of adaptive differences between high altitude and tropically residing Denisovans? Well, so the only place where we have Denisovan genomes is then from southern Siberia. There is, of course, the work by Rasmus Nielsen at Berkeley that have shown that in Tibet there is this haplotype in this gene called EPAS1 that's associated with adaptation to living at high altitude and having less miscarriages and things as a result of that. And that haplotype is in the Denisovan genome. So it's very tempting and quite likely actually that that comes from Denisovans into the ancestor of Tibetans. And that's why it fits so well and it's exciting to find this 160 or more years old, probably Denisovan 
in Tibet. That's the only thing concretely that I would be aware of that is sort of adaptation to different habitats that we know about from the Nesimans. Gotcha. Um, this question from uh, Rory Johnson is a PI. Um, how, how does the production line for ancient DNA sequencing currently work? How has it been refined in the decades since the first Neanderthal genome? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so there are a number of things uh, from when we started this that are improvements. Some is in how you produce the libraries. So something that uh, Matthias Meyer has developed is this single strand protocol for making libraries, where we nowadays start by denaturing the DNA and ligating on uh, adapters by uh, single strand ligation on them. So each double-stranded molecule then have two chances to end up in the library, and that turns out to be quite important, because often have modifications that make it impossible to replicate the DNA, but it's specific to one strand, so then we have the other strand get the chance to generate the library molecule. There are other things too, uh, is for example, treating uh, bone samples with mild bleach turns out to be able to reduce contamination in many cases. And there are things we are beginning now to microsample the, the, the bones. It turns out that it's probably very localized where the DNA is preserved. So earlier on, we would take like, you know, half a milligram of bone and prepare a library. Now we generally do like five uh, milligrams or so 10 milligrams and do several samples. And then it can often turn out that one of these lead a good library and the others don't. So there are a number of things like that. Gotcha. Yeah. So why don't we? Why don't we? I think we're pushing up against the the end of the question time. So why don't we go with uh, another good kind of um, uh, ending question here? Yeah. One, uh, one last question. Yeah. Manal um, Jam Sandikar, a PhD student. What do you think the future of modern humans after around a hundred thousand years will look like? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. It depends on the viruses and things that will come along. I don't know. <laughs> I only avoid that question and say I think cultural evolution is so much more important nowadays than biological evolution. I think that's a that's a fair answer. So um, okay, well why don't we why don't we stop there and there you, more questions can be answered offline and in Slack. But why don't we uh, give uh, Svante another round of virtual applause for a. Really fantastic um, keynote talk and um, uh, really awesome work.